Alright, so check out this dude. He's got some nice looking lungs here, and he's a pretty normal human, so every time he breathes, he pulls in some oxygen. That oxygen zooms down this big airway, called the trachea, and then splits down one of these two branches, called bronchi. Then splits some more into the bronchioles, until it finally ends up in these little sacs called alveoli, which sort of look like little clumps of grapes. And these guys are nestled right up against some tiny, tiny blood vessels, and at this point the oxygen's like, see you later, and diffuses right into the bloodstream. Now, obviously oxygen's not the only thing you're breathing in though, is it? You're constantly breathing in a ton of other stuff, especially, whether you like it or not, things like microorganisms. You're usually pretty good at making sure these guys don't stick around though, and you use techniques as simple as coughing to get rid of them. <coughs> or you let your immune system do the dirty work. If a particularly nasty organism makes it in, or your defenses just aren't very good, they can start to multiply and even infect your lungs. When an organism has successfully made your lungs their new home, like your bronchioles or your alveoli, you've developed something called pneumonia, which is this infection of your lungs. When these guys really get to multiplying, your immune system responds by sending troops to help fight them off, right? So things like white blood cells. These are great and all, because they're trying to help, but what ends up happening is they cause inflammation in these areas where the organisms have set up camp. So they fill with white blood cells and other things like proteins, fluid, and even red blood cells. These obviously take up valuable space in your airways, right? So now this alveoli might be inflamed and filled with fluid. So when you breathe in some oxygen and it gets to these infected and inflamed airways, it's going to have a way harder time diffusing into the bloodstream. So because you aren't getting that oxygen into your blood as easily, one common symptom is this like shortness of breath and this difficulty breathing, which is also called dyspnea. Also, like I mentioned, we cough to try to get things out of our lungs. <coughs> so what do you think happens when we've got all this fluid and other things built up? Well, we're going to try to cough it up and make some room for oxygen. So another big symptom is coughing. Also, sometimes patients experience chest pains. Why might that be? Well, there are definitely some pain receptors near these airways and alveoli, so when they get inflamed, we can totally feel that. And finally, since your immune system is working to fight against some microbe, it's also common to get a fever. Okay, okay, so notice that I've been pretty general about the culprit, this mysterious microorganism. Why so vague? Well, because there isn't just one kind of microbe that causes pneumonia. It can actually be caused by all sorts of microbes. The most common ones, though, are bacteria and viruses, but it can also extend to fungi, as well as something called mycoplasma. Between viruses and bacteria, though, bacteria wins out and is the most common cause of pneumonia in adults, especially one called streptococcus pneumoniae, also sometimes known as pneumococcus. But just remember, it doesn't necessarily have to be caused by this one bacterium. Other bacteria that may cause pneumonia are ones like Haemophilus influenzae, Legionella pneumophila, and Staphylococcus aureus. Aside from bacteria, viruses can also be a big-time contributor to pneumonia cases, influenza probably being the most common virus that causes it. But it could also be caused by others. Fungi rarely causes pneumonia because most of our immune systems can just fight them off. But for people with weakened immune systems, like with AIDS or cancer, pneumonia from fungi can be more of an issue. A common fungus that can cause pneumonia is Pneumocystis urovecchi. Finally, these things called mycoplasma can also cause pneumonia in some cases. Mycoplasma are technically still bacteria. One important point though is that they don't have a cell wall, so common antibiotics like penicillin that work by attacking cell walls don't work against these guys. Luckily though, they're the smallest proportion that affects humans, and often don't cause serious complications and can clear up on their own. So we know that pneumonia is this infection of the lung tissue, and usually that infection is caused by some bacteria or virus, but sometimes it's fungal or caused by mycoplasma. At this point though, the microbes are already in the lungs, right? But how does it get there? Well, just like there being a ton of microbes that cause infection and pneumonia, there's also a ton of ways to actually contract these microbes, and we can categorize these. So the first category of pneumonia, and also the most common, is called community-acquired pneumonia, sometimes just shortened to CAP, or CAP. 
We can say that the pneumonia is community acquired when it happens outside of a hospital or other healthcare setting. Usually somebody gets this by breathing in microbes that live in your mouth or your nose or your throat. And this one most often happens in the winter when your immune system is weaker. Now guess what you call it when you get pneumonia from a healthcare setting or a hospital? Yep, we call those healthcare associated pneumonia and hospital acquired pneumonia, respectively. What's the difference though? Well, cases of hospital acquired pneumonia or nosocomial pneumonia include those where patients were already hospitalized for something else. And healthcare associated pneumonia just refers to those that are in frequent contact with a healthcare setting, but aren't necessarily hospitalized. So that could be like nursing homes or long term care facilities. These two types tend to be more serious, though, than community acquired pneumonia for a couple reasons. One reason is that these patients often have weakened immune systems already, like for hospital acquired. I mean, they're there because they're already sick, right? Now throw a lung infection in there, and you can imagine how that might make things a little more complicated. The second reason is that the microbes in hospitals are usually a little more intense than the ones floating around in the community. Why is that? Well, although hospitals do a great job at treating and killing most bad microbes with antibiotics or other medicines, they also sometimes inadvertently become these like breeding grounds for microbes that are actually resistant to antibiotics, like methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus which may be recognized as MRSA. Normal staph can certainly cause pneumonia and other infections, but you can also kill normal staph using traditional antibiotics like penicillins. MRSA, on the other hand, is like this mutant super staph that isn't affected by normal antibiotics, making it a lot harder to treat. Another important and more serious type of bacteria is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which also tends to be more resistant to traditional antibiotics. Alright, and one other type of pneumonia that's worth mentioning, and is along the same lines, is called ventilator-associated pneumonia. Sick patients often need help breathing, right? So they'll be connected to what's called a ventilator. If microbes somehow get in through the tube, they'll be sucked into the lungs, which can cause infection and pneumonia, especially for these patients that are already weak or sick. So besides breathing in some invisible microbe that you can't even see, are there any other ways to get pneumonia? Well, consider this. You're eating some french fries. Instead of swallowing one, you accidentally breathe it in. Informally, we would call that going down the wrong pipe, right? Also though, we could say that you aspirated that french fry. Okay, now what happens? Well, normally you'd automatically gag and start coughing and it'd go flying across the room. <laughs> well, maybe not, but it wouldn't stay there. What if these gag reflexes were compromised though? meaning that they just don't work like they should, which is actually sometimes the case for patients with brain injury or swallowing issues, or even those that have abused drugs or alcohol. So bits of it might stick around in your lower airways. And you could imagine that this french fry probably isn't the most sterile thing in the world, so it could be carrying some potentially infectious microbes. If that microbe now infects the lungs and you get pneumonia, we would call that french fry pneumonia. Just kidding, it'd be called aspiration pneumonia. And it doesn't have to be just bits of food though. It could also be like drinks or other materials, or even gastric contents. Like things from your stomach that have come up one tube and then gone back down the other tube instead. Which can actually be pretty nasty. Because what does your stomach have in it? Stomach or gastric acid. Now think about what might happen if that acid makes it into your lungs. Nothing good, right? No. Definitely not. If you aspirate some of these gastric contents into your airways, you can get a chemical burn, which will initiate your body's inflammatory reaction in your lungs. And this causes something called chemical pneumonitis, because remember that itis means inflammation, right? And what's even worse is that after this initial chemical burn, patients are often more susceptible now to infection from pathogens due to this weakness of their airways, and therefore they might develop pneumonia more easily. Okay, finally. A quick and easy type of pneumonia is called atypical pneumonia. Atypical pneumonia basically just means that it was caused by one of these organisms. Chlamydophila pneumoniae, Legionella pneumophila, or Mycoplasma pneumoniae. This type tends to be less serious than typical pneumonia, and for that reason it's sometimes referred to as walking pneumonia, because sometimes people just go about their daily lives with it. Alright, so by now we know that there's a ton of ways to classify pneumonia. 
but actually that list keeps going. So another way that we can define a case of pneumonia is by where the infection is. When the infection is super patchy, and maybe it's only affecting these like scattered alveoli, we call that bronchopneumonia, which is defined by these scattered or patchy areas of consolidation. And consolidation just means that the tissue has filled with fluid and has gotten all hard and swollen. So these areas also usually have little tiny pockets of pus or white blood cells also known as microabscesses, since they're so small you can only really see them under a microscope. Along with being in various areas of one side, this consolidation can also be bilateral, meaning that it happens on both sides. Usually it happens though in the lower lobes or right middle lobe. Speaking of lobes though, another way pneumonia might present itself is called lobar pneumonia. Where bronchopneumonia was all patchy and scattered, Lobar pneumonia is this almost complete consolidation of a whole lobe of the lung. Pretty much all cases of this, around 95%, are caused by the bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae. And usually lobar pneumonia happens in steps or stages. The first stage is called congestion and lasts between one and two days. This is where the vessels start filling with fluid. The next stage is called red hepatization between day three and four and the lobes start to get reddish brown and firm and start to resemble liver tissue, which is why we call it hepatization. Its color is red because it's this combination of red blood cells, neutrophils, and fibrin, which we can also call an exudate. And this now becomes more solid because this exudate is filling the air spaces in the alveoli, right? As the red blood cells break down and degrade though, we move into stage three around days five to seven called the gray hepatization stage, where it's still firm, but the color has changed because the cells begin to break down. Finally, the last stage is called resolution, and this happens around day eight and can continue for up to three weeks. In this stage, the exudate gets digested by enzymes and broken up, or it gets ingested by macrophages or even just coughed up. <coughs> and those are the major pieces of lobar pneumonia, but there's still one more type. Someone could have interstitial pneumonia, which is also just known as atypical pneumonia, which remember is this like walking pneumonia. And this type's localized to the tissue around alveoli. And usually there actually isn't any exudate or fluid in the alveolar spaces at all. So essentially there's no consolidation, but there will be some mononuclear infiltrate, like these white blood cells that have infiltrated these interstitial spaces. This one remember is more rare and the symptoms are actually typically pretty mild like low fever and not a lot of mucus, similar to the flu. Since there's not a ton of mucus, usually patients will have this non-productive cough along with chest pains. If we wanted to figure out if this pneumonia is characterized as interstitial pneumonia or lobar pneumonia or bronchopneumonia for that matter, we'd take a chest radiograph. And this is pretty much the gold standard. Here's an x-ray of someone with lobar pneumonia. See how the fluids localized to this upper right lobe? Here's one of bronchopneumonia. Notice how the infected areas are spread out instead of being localized to a single lobe. And finally, here's one of atypical or interstitial pneumonia, where you can see that the affected areas are more reticular because it's affecting the tissue outside the alveoli. Another way one might be able to discern lobar pneumonia, where consolidation is this key factor, is just by listening. For example, a dullness to percussion is often a sign of consolidation. Also though, you might be able to feel more vibrations from the patient's chest or back after they repeat certain phrases, a procedure called tactile vocal fremitus. And you can feel that because the sound waves travel better through fluid filled or consolidated tissue, right? You might also hear late inspiratory crackles along with bronchial breath sounds, bronchophony, and egophony. Finally, you might also use laboratory findings to figure out if the pneumonia is present or not. The most useful lab finding is a positive gram stain, which is more useful than a blood culture, even though cultures are still used and you might look for neutrophilic leukocytosis, or this abnormally high level of white blood cells in the blood, which shows that the body is likely fighting off infection of some kind. 